sins My righteousness Oh God, how I need
morning. It is good to see you all here in the Lord's house today. And of course, it's uh, the uh, Father's Day for us here. We're going to be recognizing our dads. It's also a change for Children's Sunday today. And uh, we're also going to be giving you all an update on our VBS this past week. So we've got a whole lot going on this morning. And I'm glad that you're here to be a part of it. But most of all, we want to lift up Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who went to Calvary's cross for our sins. We just, uh, just heard the praise team sing the song that it was our sin that held him there on the cross and uh, because you and I are sinners Jesus uh, paid the price and went to Calvary's cross for us and I'm so thankful that he offers that free gift of salvation to everyone that believes and trusts in him and today is a day of salvation if you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today you can be saved and born again and uh, that's the good news of the gospel that we have to share today but uh, I'm glad you're here it's good to have visitors with us today. God bless you for being here and joining us today. And, uh, and so let's begin with a word of prayer. We'll ask God to bless us. And then we're going to all sing together and worship our Lord and Savior together today. But let's start with a word of prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ who went to Calvary's cross for our sins. Thank you, dear Lord, for that, that wonderful gift of life that we have through Jesus. I pray today, dear Lord, that each one of us will lift up Christ with our voices and in our hearts and in our lives today today. If there's one here today that's lost, I pray today would be that day of salvation. But I pray that each one of us here today, dear Lord, to lift up Jesus Christ in our lives, that we just follow your will, that we just submit ourselves to your plan, that we worship and praise you today as you lead and guide us. Bless this worship service. Bless the dads that are here today. We thank you so much for them. And just help us, I pray, to be a blessing to all of our dads in our lives today, in the service, but also in our lives throughout this day as well. I just pray that uh, we would just show our appreciation and love uh, for the men that did so much for us, dear Heavenly Father. But I just pray we, we exalt and praise you as our Heavenly Father most of all today. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together as that leads us in our first song. Good morning. Uh, go ahead and stand together, if you will, uh, as we turn to our first song, uh, Here I Am to Worship. The word Oh 
Jessica and Jordan's dad too, but it's it's cool. Matthew. I, I, yes, sir. I know. Dad, I, I don't think you do know. No, oh, no, I know. I heard you talking up the line. I was sitting just four feet from you. Well, I meant it. Thank you. Father's Day to all of our dads out there. And it's funny how it can be kind of hard to say at times uh, how much we love and appreciate those special people in our lives, but we need to make an effort and let them know. And I, and I understand, you know, as a father, I understand, you know, we know our kids love us, uh, but uh, but it means something special to, uh, to honor them and to recognize them. And today we definitely want to recognize those dads in our lives that mean so much to us. And, and, uh, and so as a church, we try to recognize the men that step up as leaders in our homes. And of course, I know many of y'all have seen, we've got the baskets out in the foyer and in the lobby out here. Uh, just a small gift for all the men uh, here today. And so even, even if you're not a dad, for all the men that are here, we do have this gift. And it's just a, it's just a, it's a little tape measure uh, and, uh, and level here, just a little something there to, that maybe will help you out. Uh, it's, uh, it may be a nice one to put in the car or, or, or somewhere close by, just somewhere you need something small and handy, uh, but it's got a little pen attached as well. Uh, but just a little something just to remind you of the importance of a man of faith as well, and uh, as well as to show our appreciation to you. Uh, without the men of this church and fathers in this church, uh, we would not be able to accomplish God's will and God's work for us here. And so I'm so thankful for you and the influence you have in your homes, uh, in your children, your grandchildren's lives, as well as in the other kids' lives in our church as well. And so I 
appreciate the fathers that we have. And of course, we're following the example of our Heavenly Father. And that's really what we ought to recognize. And, and just by way of Scripture, I want to remind you, Psalms 103, verses 11 through 13, the Bible says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Fear him. God loves us and cares for us. And, and just as our fathers, uh, they, uh, uh, they pity us is, is the biblical phrase there. But the idea is, is they forgive and they understand. And, and, uh, and I know sometimes dads get angry and frustrated. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost become a meme now. But, you know, I grew up in the age where I had to hold the flashlight for my dad when he was working on the car. And, and uh, you get a lot of, uh, you, sometimes you get some snappy, frustrated remarks there. But, uh, but I am thankful for my dad and I'm thankful for a heavenly father that pities me he knows I make mistakes and God cares and loves, so He is merciful and forgiving to me. And so this Father's Day, let's recognize the fact that uh, we have a Heavenly Father that loves us and is merciful and gracious to us. And so to all of our dads, we say thank you. And to our Heavenly Father today, we want to show our love and appreciation um, as well. And, uh, and of course, it is also uh, not just Father's Day, but we've also finished up our Vacation Bible School uh, this week. And so I know we're going to cover a lot of territory here in just a few moments, uh, but I do want to uh, just take a moment and, um, and just give a quick update on VBS. We did have a good week of Vacation Bible School. Uh, we just ran it uh, three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're going to scroll a few pictures up there. Uh, if you can make those out, we'll have a few pictures scrolling there behind me. And uh, there's also going to be pictures scrolling in the foyer as well. Uh, but, uh, but I appreciate so much all the hard work that went into Vacation Bible School and there are so many folks that uh, uh, that, that came to work days or, or outreach uh, folks that prayed and gave you guys give so many snacks every year I'll be honest with you uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Sunday school classes and other classes are having are enjoying the snacks still that y'all brought in and, and unfortunately the pastor enjoyed a few of those snacks throughout the week as well uh, but uh, uh, more than he should have but but y'all y'all do such a great job in all all the hard work that you do and it was such a blessing this year and so just a re quick recap and, and let me just say this I cannot and I, 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 I should have taken the time to write down everybody's name but I'd be afraid I'd miss somebody I appreciate all the people that came out to help out with VBS this week our volunteers were just just really awesome and um, the vans and the snacks and, and the lesson time and registering kids and, and just sitting with kids. You know, I, I tell people crowd control is such an important part of Vacation Bible School. And, and uh, we had some, some adults that just jumped in and got involved. And, and it was all such a blessing. Um, I don't know if I mentioned games and snacks, but all those things were just, everything was done very well. The adults did a great job. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for uh, the kids that came out. And many of y'all, you know, Tuesday morning, I called the prayer chain and asking y'all to pray for VBS. Monday night was a really a good night, uh, but the attendance was really low. It was probably the lowest attendance we've had in a long time. And so I asked y'all to pray. And even though we had we had two kids get saved on Monday night, uh, the attendance was down. And so I asked y'all to, to pray. And, uh, and and I'll tell you what, you guys prayed and God answered uh, your prayer request. We, uh, we we increased by about 50% on Tuesday night. We ended up uh, with, uh, with more than double uh, the kids there on the last night and uh, we ended up with eight kids that got saved. We had uh, two kids who came forward for assurance of faith and so we really had a tremendous week of Vacation Bible School and so I just want to say thank you so much to all of you that participated. You worked hard. You, you came out. Uh, you prayed and uh, your prayers made a difference. It really did and so uh, thank you for all the hard work that you put in this year to Vacation Bible School and, and pray as well if you well, we had a lot of kids come to our VBS that do not attend this church, and, uh, and a lot of kids don't attend any church. And as we try to reach out to them, as we try to get them into church, pray that we just have a positive impact in reaching those kids, uh, not just for Christ and salvation, but also to be in church as well. 
So pray for our follow-up, if you will, as we'll be trying to reach out to these kids and encouraging them to come out and be a part of VBS. But the attitudes were great. The participation of the kids was great. They were excited this, this year. And that's one of the reasons why we had so many more kids coming out. The kids were excited about VBS and what was going on, and they invited their friends. And uh, we really did have a good week. So thank you so much to all of you that participated and that worked so hard in making Vacation Bible School a success. And so now we also... So one more thing we have to take care of before uh, we, uh, we sing our next song. And uh, the third Sunday of every month is our Change for Children uh, Sunday. And we always just take uh, just a, a moment to take up a special offering for our children's ministry. And so I would encourage you, I would invite you uh, here today uh, to check your purse and your pocket. If you've got a little bit of loose change uh, or, uh, or maybe even a dollar or two, uh, we want to take up a special offering for our kids. I'm going to ask our kids to come on up. They're going to help us with this offering. They're going to grab a little bucket. They'll line up here up front, and uh, and they're going to help receive this offering uh, here today. And so if you've got some loose change, if you've got... Um, uh, um, and Keegan, would you come help us up here too, please? Uh, if you've got a little bit of loose change, if you've got even a dollar or two, whatever goes into these buckets is going to help. Hey, guys, why don't you guys come over here into the middle, over here. Hey, boys, come over here to the middle. And uh, um, But uh, but they're going to help us take up this offering. So here's what we're going to do. Keegan's going to play for us. As Keegan plays, we're going to invite you to come up and uh, to bring your change, your loose change offering up here and, and give and support our children's ministry. Everything that goes in these buckets supports the children's ministry, helps make vacation Bible school and other activities a success. So Keegan, as you play, you come on up and bring your loose change offering today. Your, your generosity to our children's ministry and uh, uh, and uh, pray for our kids and of course we've always got them out running on vacation other things are in school year or in the summertime I'm sorry but uh, but it's good to see the kids that we have here right now give them a round of applause as they head back to children's church let them know let them know that you love them and, uh, and continue to pray for our kids pray for us and our children's ministry all those teachers and workers and helpers in that ministry you pray for them and give them a word of encouragement as you have opportunity as well well, at this time, Alex's going to come and lead us in our next song. Alex? Stand again, if you will, as we turn to hymn number 337, Nothing But the Blood.
start making your way back to your seats. Uh, you may be seated as we turn to our final song, hymn number 705, It Is Well With My Soul.
Amen. As the ushers make their way forward, let me encourage you today to join us as we worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings at this time. And uh, you be faithful to give back as God has blessed you. Honor the Lord today with your tithes, your faith promise, missions giving. Uh, if you're a visitor here with us today, I would encourage you to drop that um, uh, that uh, gift, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, visitor card. Visitors do visitor cards in the offering plate at this time. But we're so glad that you're here. But, uh, but let's worship the Lord together as we give back to Him as He has blessed us with heads bowed and eyes closed. Brandon, would you lead us as we pray, please, sir? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for many blessings and opportunities you give us, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord, and worship you to say your word, Lord. I just pray that uh, you'd open up the, our hearts and minds to the preaching of your word, Lord. I just pray that you make an impact on our lives, Lord, that we uh, apply to our lives and go out and um, work, do your work, Lord. I just pray that uh, any soul here not saved, that you'd soften their heart, that they might accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And I just pray you be with this offering, Lord. Be with the gift and the giver, Lord. I just pray that you give us the wisdom of God's Lord. He is to your glory, Lord. And I just pray all these things in the Lord's name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I think all of us have an understanding of the importance and value of fathers. And certainly on this Father's Day, it's something that we do ponder in, in our own lives and we think about, uh, but also in our society um, in general. I think that we have a good understanding that uh, fathers are very necessary, especially as we've seen in more recent years, uh, the absence of fathers in so many homes. Um, and uh, I saw this number, it's rather uh, staggering, 17.8 million children, nearly a quarter of all kids uh, live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. They don't have a father in the household, almost a quarter of all children. And we understand what this means uh, to kids today. Uh, there's a greater risk of poverty. They're more likely to have behavioral problems. They're more likely to commit crimes and end up in prison. Uh, girls are more likely to become pregnant as teenagers without a father in the home. They, 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 they face more abuse and neglect. There's they're more likely to use drugs and alcohol and to drop out of school. These are all realities. Just the, the, the odds go up without the father in the home. The odds of these social problems and moral problems just increase exponentially. And, uh, and, and we need to recognize the value of fathers. Certainly in the world in which we live today, where, uh, you know, where today uh, people can't figure out what gender they are uh, when, when, when we make excuses for having uh, two dads or two moms in a home instead of a mother and father as God established the house to be. As we see the issues going on in our society even more today, we need to recognize the importance of fathers. And certainly in our lives, it starts with us recognizing the value of the dads uh, that we had growing up and, and our, our fathers personally. And hopefully you look with fondness on, on how you were raised and how your father raised you. And, and boy, we can go down the list of the influence dads had in our lives, teaching us to uh, ride a bike or to throw a ball or to shoot a basket or to shoot a gun, helping us with our homework and, and teaching us how to drive, uh, fixing our cars and maybe teaching us to fix them as well. So much of what we are today is because of our fathers. A lot, a lot of our opinions about sports teams or politics or automobiles. It's funny, my, my dad when he was in college, he, he worked for GM on the assembly line there in Arlington, Texas, the General Motors assembly plant. And, 
And uh, my grandpa, my mom's dad, worked for Ford uh, up in Detroit, Michigan. And, and, uh, and so that, uh, there was a little bit of a difference of opinion about, uh, uh, about which cars were better in the household, but uh, in the family. But, uh, but, but we develop opinions about our automobiles uh, about, uh, from our dads. Some things we inherit from our dads, like our, like our good looks. Uh, or our pot bellies, or our bald heads, uh, uh, we inherit from our dads. And and uh, years ago, uh, years ago, I I, um, I I was I was using an illustration of, of inheriting traits from our father. I was making a spiritual application of us being more like our heavenly father. And I talked about so many uh, of of the men in the church that are bald headed are bald headed because their dad was bald headed, and that was a trait they picked up from him. And ever since I told that joke, uh, brother Don Castle. Had has, uh, has, has walked up behind me, and of course he always looks down on me. I don't know what his problem is. He always walk, looks down on me. He'll walk up behind me, and he'll look down on my head and say, I've got a bald spot right there. <laughs> Makes me self-conscious. i got to go run and look in the mirror every time and feel for that bald spot. He told me that this morning. I said, it's all grown back now. <laughs> it's a comb over, yeah. <laughs> uh, i got to adjust my toupee there a little bit. But uh, uh, this is all the real deal. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, we inherit these things from our dads. So many things we get from our dads. Sometimes it's negative things as well. And sometimes we have negative memories of our fathers. But we need fathers in our lives to train up children the way they should go. But more, can I tell you something today, more than a dad that teaches us how to shoot a basket or drive a car, more than a dad that'll, that'll pass on uh, good genes or, or good habits, we need spiritual fathers today. And I want to bring you a message today on spiritual fatherhood, spiritual fatherhood. And this is a message that goes beyond biological dads or stepdads or, or, or adoptive fathers because spiritual fatherhood is something the Bible teaches us. It, it, it's something that needs to be taken on as a responsibility by more than just the biological fathers and grandfathers in our lives. Of course, it starts there. The imperative is given again and again uh, for parents to, to raise up your children in the Lord and, and in the fear of the Lord and, 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 and to admonish them in the Lord and, and to train them up in the way they should go. And of or spiritual teaching and instruction it always begins at the home it's interesting uh, you know if we have problems with our kids we'll blame their friends and the video games and, and the school and the church uh, but uh, it starts with mom and dad if there's a problem listen parents it starts here with, the, with moms and dads, that's where the responsibility begins. And certainly spiritually and morally, it begins with that biological parent. But it goes so far beyond that. As we turn in our text here to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, we're going to find a father-son relationship that is not biological, but it is spiritual. It's spiritual fatherhood that we want to address today. We're going to take a look at the Apostle Paul. And his son in the Lord, his spiritual son, Timothy. And the relationship that they have with one another. And, and, and just, we're going we're gonna to jump over to the books of 1 and 2 Timothy a little bit. But 1 Timothy 1, 2, Paul addresses this letter to Timothy. And he says unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And I want to look at this relationship that the Apostle Paul has with Timothy and the important lessons that are passed on. We don't know a whole lot about Timothy. He's one of those individuals we find little information that pops up here and there throughout the New Testament. We, we know that uh, he's from a... Uh, we know what region he's from. We don't even know his hometown. When we're first introduced to him, we find three different cities that are mentioned in the region in which he lives. Derby and Lystra and Iconium are all listed in the region. It's, it's one area. Uh, and maybe he was a, a country boy. Maybe he didn't live in town. I don't know. We know that his father was a Greek, but we know that his mother was, was Jewish and, and, and she was godly and his grandmother was a godly woman. And, 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 and his, his, his spiritual and moral upbringing came primarily from the women in his lives in his life. And these women influenced him greatly spiritually. 
And his father, we don't know if he was a good dad or a bad dad. But we know when it came to spirituality, his dad played a very small role in his life, spiritually. And when the Apostle Paul came along, he was able to take him under his wing and rear him up as his son in the faith, as a spiritual child. And I know a lot of times we look at this, and, and, and you'll find a reference here in our text in just a moment about, about being begotten and, and, and being born again. And, and I don't think Paul led Timothy to the Lord. I think Timothy was already saved. And, and we, we know that from the book of Acts when we're first introduced. When Paul is first introduced to Timothy, Timothy's already a disciple and he's already a, a, a faithful a servant. He's well thought of amongst the other Christians in that area. Derby, Lystra, and Iconium area. He's well thought of spiritually. And so I don't think Paul led him to the Lord. But Paul was a spiritual father to him. And let's look at our text here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. The Apostle Paul is going to address the importance of spiritual fatherhood as he addresses the church in Corinth. And he'll also remind us of his relationship there with young Timothy as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll begin in verse number 14. The Apostle Paul says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. And so here Paul is taking on the position of spiritual father in the church in Corinth under the inspiration of God's Word. And he says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I said unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into, the, into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. The Apostle Paul says, you're my children. I don't want to shame you. I don't want to hurt you. I want to warn you. I want to help you. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of disagreements happen between fathers and sons because dads want to warn our children and help our children and, 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 and kids get offended. And, and I'll be honest with you, it's easy. You get to a certain age uh, with your parents and, and, uh, and, 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 and you don't want to do what they say anymore and, 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 and you feel like you've got things figured out yourself. But, but a father's responsibility, certainly you think about that relationship between a father and that teenage son or even that pre-teen uh, son, that uh, our, our daughter and, and, and dad tries to give instruction and it's resisted and rebelled against by the child because they feel like they know better and, and, and dad's an old fogey and dad, you know, dad grew up in a different era and, and, uh, and he doesn't understand the way things work anymore and so, so we disregard and so often there is problems here and the apostle Paul as a spiritual father is addressing the problems in the church in Corinth not because he doesn't like them not because he's angry at them and not, not, to, not to hurt them, but to warn them. Not to bring shame, but a warning and correction. And he says, As I've sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. See, Timothy was a young man that Paul took in under his wing and helped him to grow and mature spiritually to the point to where Timothy was not just, he wasn't always just, you know, uh, in, in Paul's shadow. He grew up to such a status that Paul could send him out. And you find throughout the writings of the Apostle Paul, throughout the New Testament, into the book of Hebrews and other books, that Timothy is sent to various churches to minister and to serve and, and, and to lead and to pastor. Because he was trained up with a good spiritual father. And today, I'll be honest with you, this message today is to encourage spiritual leadership. Because we need you 
as, as men and, and women of this church, we need you to, to take under your wing those that are younger. And, and it, may be, it may be our 20-somethings, or it may be our teens, or it may be our kids, but to take under your wing those that are younger, and that they can just learn and grow and, and, and mature spiritually. And if we need our older, we need our older folks here to set the right example and the right pattern and to be godly, uh, faithful Christians that can set the right pattern and and standard for our younger believers. But we also need the younger. And, and I, I, I can put myself on both sides. Many of y'all can as well. There are some of you older than me that I can learn and grow from your experience. There are some younger than me that I can lead and guide. But we need, each of us need to be willing to learn and to grow and, and to, to, to take the warnings of those around us, to take those warnings to heart so that we can not be shamed and not be hurt or harmed, but so that we can grow and mature spiritually. Because you and I are going to make mistakes and somebody else here can help you learn and grow through that time and that difficulty. So the message today is to encourage spiritual leadership, but also spiritual learning. Because we need both. We need both. And we'll identify that in this relationship between a spiritual father and his son in the faith. As we look at the Apostle Paul, as we look at young Timothy, as Paul calls him, my own son, in the faith. Let's pray and ask God to bless the preaching of His Word today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You so much for sending Your Son to die on Calvary's cross for us. To pay that penalty for our sins. And thank You, dear Heavenly Father, for sending individuals, dear Lord, certainly special men into our lives, dear Lord, that have set good examples to help us to learn and to grow spiritually. Not just emotionally, not just physically, dear Lord, but, but, but those spiritual fathers that have come into our lives that have helped us to grow and learn. And I just pray to Heavenly Father today that we'd have a new generation of, of men and women that will step up and, and be spiritual leaders so that the young men and young women in our church can learn and to grow and develop and to, 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 to be what you'd have them to be. And help, dear Lord, each of the younger people here today to be open and willing to learn the lessons that the elders have learned and they want to share. Help our younger people here today, dear Lord, to learn what it, what it means to be a spiritual leader in, in other people's lives as well. And help each of us here, dear Lord, today to draw nearer to you, to better understand your will for our lives, dear Lord. Bless that one today that's lost, that they'd see that they need Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But I pray in the service today, you'd be magnified and that your will would be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to jump over here. And we're going to look through, basically through the books of 1 and 2 Timothy uh, and, and draw out some of the important lessons that the Apostle Paul is teaching Timothy. Now, now understand, just understanding uh, the books of the Bible, understanding these letters here uh, from Paul to Timothy. In our Bibles here, they're called books of the Bible. They're, 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 we find them under the, the titles of 1 and 2 Timothy. And, and, and as we look at these, we understand that they were written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. They're words of instruction and encouragement and help and guidance and direction, not just for Timothy himself, but to pass on for others. But we understand that this is more than just a letter from the spiritual father to a spiritual son. These are written under the inspiration of God. God inspired Paul to write these letters to preserve the instruction and the information and to preserve the relationship that Paul had with Timothy for our edification, for our benefit today. Because God not only inspired Paul to write these, these are God's inspired word that are passed on to Timothy, but God has preserved this word to pass on to us today to learn and to grow from. And so that we too can, we can share with others to teach and instruct so that we can also take in and learn and grow. And as we look here at these various lessons, and we're just going to look primarily at three and, 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 uh, and, and, and maybe a half a dozen, uh, seven or so different verses we're going to look at here in First and Second. Timothy. Timothy, as we look at this, we're going to see, number one, we're going to see lessons that Paul has taught already. And so these are, these are lessons that Paul has, as I'm sure he has shared with Timothy on numerous occasions, and he comes back now to remind him. 
And guess what, Christian? You know what you need? You need to be reminded of God's lessons for us. Because you know what I need? I need to be reminded of God's lessons for me. I can't just read it once and learn it once and just be done with it. I have to go back again and be refreshed and reminded again and again of the lessons of God's Word. And so some of these are going to be those repetitive lessons. And don't, don't you love it? <laughs> Whether you're the parent or the child, don't you? Oh, don't don't the repetitive lessons uh, just uh, uh, just make you so happy? Uh, you know, I can hear I can hear uh, uh, we'll just say a generic dad out there saying, "I've told you before, I've told you before, I've told you before, don't do that or do that." And uh, and I can hear frustration in this in this you know uh, generic father's voice. Uh, you know, I've told. You before, and, uh, uh, and 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 as a child, as a recipient of that, uh, you know, I can, uh, you know, I, I can, I can see the frustration. It's like, uh, yes, I've heard it already. Yes, you've told me that already. Yes, I already know that. And sometimes we don't want the repetitive lessons. We don't want to share the repetitive lessons. We don't want to hear the repetitive lessons, but we need them. And if you're the child and you keep messing up, then you need to be reminded again and again. If you're that child and you forget, and we all forget. <laughs> just, just today. I was reminded of something I forgot. I forgot it twice. We were cleaning up for BBS on Wednesday night and I was using a hammer out back and... And I, I, I walked outside, I was outside Thursday or Friday, and I found my hammer, I forgot it and left it in the grass. It was already starting to get a little bit of rust on it. So I went, and I wasn't coming inside yet, but I went, I set it, I set it back here on this, this little porch that's over here, this little porch right over here. I set it there so I could bring it in later. And this morning, Bill came in and said, Pastor, I left something on your desk, you forgot your hammer. I didn't forget it once. I forgot it twice. It was still sitting out there Sunday morning. Bill had to bring it in for me. Hey, we forget things. Amen? Amen. And it's not just because I'm old either. All right? So don't be thinking that. It's not because I'm old. and not just because of that. That's right. It's not just because I'm old. We forget things. We need to be reminded. Don't get angry when the pastor comes back and reminds you of something, when God comes back and reminds you of something. But Paul's not just going to tell him some old things that he needs to be reminded of. There's some new things or something fresh here that you and I need. And it may be a new application to an old lesson. But there's going to be something new and something fresh here that we need to know today. And so let's take a look here at three, primarily three lessons that the Apostle Paul is going to be sharing with young Timothy as, as a spiritual father to his son in the faith. And the first is one of godly worship. It's godly worship. I'll tell you something, we cannot be reminded enough that we need to exalt God, that we need to worship Him, and how to worship Him. Because here's a, here's a problem here. There's a problem that you and I have. We like to do things our way. Have you noticed that? You don't want to do things my way, and you don't want to do things dad's way or mom's way. You want to do things your way. This is just the flesh leads us in that direction. And, uh, and, and, and we, we have this tendency to go off and, and just make our own way and do our own thing. Can I tell you something? There is a right way in many things, and there is a wrong way in many things. Now, your mom may have given you a recipe. I don't bake. I don't cook. I don't, I don't know much about this, but I'm just, I'm just kind of theorizing here. But your mom might have passed down a recipe to you. And, and you might say, well, here, I'll just give you a real-world example. My mom, we grew up, the Dave's family grew up with fresh apple cake. Every, I'll say every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, fresh apple cake. I eat fresh apple cake every single day. But we save it for special occasions. That's a Dave's family tradition. And, uh, and, and I'm so thankful that my mom shared that recipe with my wife. And my wife, when my parents can't do it, my wife will make fresh apple cake. But you know what my wife does? She tweaked that recipe a little bit. Boy, that's okay. I'm right between a rock and a hard place, so I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> she tweaked the recipe a little bit. My mom puts nuts in her fresh apple cake. My wife does not put nuts in her fresh apple cake. 
I love, with or without, I love fresh apple cake. It is great. I'm, I'm walking a fine line here. I love that fresh apple cake. Trust me, neither my mom nor my wife has ever served me fresh apple cake that I've turned my nose up at it and said it's not good enough. That has never yet happened. But it's different. Hey, you can tweak some things. You can change some things. Some rules are laid down and you can kind of you can kind of do them your own way and go about doing things your own way with some things are flexible. Can I tell you something? When it comes to worship, I'll tell you what, make sure you do it God's way. And I know there's always some flexibility. Some people have talents and abilities that others don't have. Some people have a, have a greater talent in singing than other people do. Uh, uh, you know, there's different talents and abilities in the way that we worship. But I'll tell you something. We need to make sure that we worship according to God's plan, according to the instructions that He laid out, because it's the exaltation and, it, and it's praising Him. Ultimately, that's... That's so important we remember that. 1 Timothy 1.17, the Apostle Paul, he zooms in on this idea of the importance and the value and the priority of recognizing that it is God. It is God that we serve. It is God that gets the preeminence. It is God that, that, that we are praising and worshiping today. In 1 Timothy 1.17, he, he says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul wants to Timothy to know that it's to God and the King Eternal, the immortal, invisible, and only wise God. It's to Him that we give our honor and glory to forever and ever. We, he doesn't share that honor and glory with others. And if we're lifting up a person, if we're lifting up a program, if we're lifting up anything, our, our entertainment, if we're lifting up anything, our, our passion for money, or our, or our family even, we lift these things up above God. Can I tell you something? It is tainted, it is twisted, it is idolatry, and it is wrong. It's to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God that we give our honor and glory to forever and ever. God deserves our praise. That's God's purpose for us. Christian, listen, it is God's purpose for us to give our glory and honor to God forever and ever. That's what God wants from your life. And you need to remember that when you go to work and you spend time with family and in your hobbies and in your interests, that we have a purpose that's greater than ourselves, that's greater than our interests and greater than our family. We have a purpose in praising God. God, the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God. That's why God's made you the way you are. 1 Peter 2, 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of the darkness into His marvelous light. God has created us as a peculiar people, a holy nation, a, a, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, to show forth the praises of God. As we worship Him, we show it. We go to church, we read our Bibles, we pray, we live out a righteous life to show our praise to God. And if you want to have an impact on somebody, as a spiritual leader, as a spiritual father, if you want to have an impact on somebody, you've got to be different. If you want to make a difference, you've got to be different. And show forth the praises of Him who's called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. It's praising God and it's praying to God as well. Such an essential part of our worship. In 1 Timothy 2.8, the Bible says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Here's Paul. He's talking about in our worship. As we lift up our holy hands, he says, and pray to God. And, 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 and without wrath and doubting, we pray to God. Uh, can I tell you something? Prayer is spiritual sacrifice. Prayer is yielding ourselves. It is trusting God. It is humbling ourselves before God. Prayer is worship, and we come to God to lift Him up and to humble ourselves. We come to God to trust Him with our burdens and to praise Him with our blessings. We come to God in worship as we pray. And that sacrifice of prayer that we make, we are yielding ourselves fully to Him. And real prayer is a yielding and a sacrifice and a surrender. And we have a calling to worship God in prayer and in praise. Paul also instructed young Timothy in how to walk. In how to walk, to have a godly walk. 
And we talk about a walk, we're talking about the way that we live our lives. And that means to exemplify what it means to be a Christian. In 1 Timothy 4.2, if you look at your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, we know this passage well. We use this, we use this for our young people all the time. And it's a great, it's a great verse to share with children and, and teenagers and young adults. But I'll tell you what, it's a great, it's a great lesson there for all of us. In 1 Timothy 4.12. Paul wants Timothy to be an example of what a believer is. He says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity and spirit and faith and purity. And, and, and here's a warning to us that are older. There's a warning to us that are older. That we don't look down our nose at somebody because of their age. And Paul specifically commands Timothy, Don't let anybody despise you because you're young. But instead, here's what he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be an example of the believers. Exemplify Christianity, in other words. And he does this in word, which means in the things that he says, it is caught, and, and we, I've got to be careful with the word conversation because it has a bigger meaning than, than how we often use it. But in the, in the way he, he communicates to people verbally, that's the word. In the things that you speak, the things that you say, be an example of the believers. Also in conversation. And that word conversation, as I said, it's got a much bigger meaning than how we oftentimes apply it. Today we use conversation mainly in a very narrow sense, just talking about speaking to one another. The word conversation here in the Greek, it's talking about how we communicate with the world, how we relay information uh, to the world around us. And that includes verbally, but it also includes with our actions, and, and it includes the, the, the way that we dress. And we tell the world, you know... The way you dress will tell the world something about you. And and, and you know if and if you're you know if if, if you're wearing you know shorts and, and a tank top and flip flops and, and and you know you know we would say, hey, that person's relaxed and casual today. If you're wearing a suit and tie, that, that tells the world that there's something dressy is going on today. If you wear if you wear a buckeyes t shirt, that tells the world something about you. If you wear a Nebraska Cornhuskers t-shirt, that tells the world something else about you. The way we dress, certainly the way that we talk. And, and the way that we say, not just what we say, but the way that we say things. I always worry. I send texts. Sometimes I have to explain text messages. And, and sometimes I, you know, I'll send out a text message and, and I'll, I'll be trying to send out a joke. But you know, the problem with a text message is, is that there's, there's, no, there's no correct emphasis in a text message. You know? and, and so sometimes I'll send out a text message and then, and then I'll have to come back and, and follow it up with, you know, I'm sorry, I was, I, that was a joke. Or that was a bad joke. But, but you know, because you, know, you, you can't always read the intent in a, in a text message. And, and sometimes the way we we say things, it, it imparts something about us and more than just the words that we say. Now I can say, that was great. Or I can say, that was great. Same thing, but different message. Now, how, now the words that we say, they impart something. They communicate something about us. The way you drive your car. I use this illustration all the time. And I really have to be careful about this one, so, uh, in case y'all see me driving down the road someday. Uh, the way we drive tells the world something about you. If you cut me off, you're going 100 miles per hour down the highway, you're communicating something. If you're going 45 on the high interstate, that tells me something about you as well. But the way our conversation is more than just words, it's, it's the way we relay ourselves to the world as well as in charity, our love, in our spirit, our spiritual walk, our, our faith, trusting in God, our purity, in living a righteous and clean life. He's saying exemplify what a Christian is. Walk in a godly way in every aspect of your life. Let people see Christ in you. And certainly as you're serving in the church as well. And, and Paul, wants, Paul takes great care in 
writing to young Timothy about how the church should function and, and, and who should be a pastor and who should be a deacon and, and, and how the church should determine that. And he gives them this message here in, in 1 Timothy 3.14, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I want you to know how you should serve in the church. And have a godly walk. And Paul's giving instruction as a spiritual father to his son in the faith of how to walk a godly walk. And also instruction in godly wisdom. Our instruction in godly wisdom, so much of that comes from a, from a spiritual father here writing to his son in the faith, young Timothy by Paul. And God shares with us some of the greatest keys. And I know we're going to look at a few verses I know you're already familiar with. We're going to look at a few verses here today that I know you're familiar with because they're such valuable, um, uh, they got so much valuable instruction for us in how to handle the message from God's Word. And Paul wants Timothy to know where to gain wisdom, how to be wise. And it's through God's Word. It is the Scripture folks that completes us we're talking about it here in my Sunday school class that you know it's it's spiritual food the Bible is spiritual food we need it to nourish us to help us to grow if you're not in your Bible you know what you're doing spiritually you're flatlining you're not growing if you're not in your Bible you need God's Word to grow, to complete us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you want to be grown up and furnished unto all good works, you've got to understand that the Bible, it is the Bible, God's Word, that's going to complete us. And all Scripture, every single bit of this, is given by inspiration of God. Amen. That means that God, that word in the Greek is theonutos. Inspiration is theonutos, which means God breathed. Literally, God breathed. These are God's words that are recorded here in the Bible that God has shared with us. And He's used Paul to write them down and record them. He's used Peter, and He's used John, and He's used Isaiah, and He's used Moses, and He's used David, and He's used many individuals uh, throughout the centuries to record His message, His word, working through people. But it is God's word. It is given by inspiration of God. And every single bit of it, not only is it given by inspiration of God, but it is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And you need this instruction, and you need this doctrine, and you need this reproof, and you need this correction so that you can be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you want to be what God's called you to be, you want to grow up, and you want to be effective as a Christian, you've got to learn from God's Word. Let it shape and mold you. Let it correct you. Let it reprove you. Let it teach you. We fail because we're not in God's Word so often. The wisdom that we need is in God's Word. The Scripture completes us. It is study that brings comprehension. And it's not osmosis. You know, when I was in school, half the study and I did was like this right here. You know, that's how I studied. I'd fall asleep on my books. And I didn't learn nothing that way. You ain't going to learn anything by just carrying it under your arm there. You ain't going to learn anything just by having the app on your phone. You ain't going to learn anything by, 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 just, uh, by, by just saying that, that you're a Christian or by owning, you know, I probably own uh, probably eight or nine different Bibles that are sitting on my shelf in there. I've got them downloaded on my, uh, on my phone and, and on my tablet and on my computer. But if I don't actually use it and study it, it doesn't benefit me. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Listen, Timothy wasn't going to get anywhere just because Paul, he, you know, he had the name of Paul there as his teacher. Timothy wasn't going to be a great preacher. He wasn't going to be a great servant. He wasn't going to be effective in the ministry just because of his lineage, just because his mom and his grandmother were spiritual. He needed to study the word. And that brings the approval of God. That also allows you to be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That also allows you to rightly divide the word of truth. 
You want to use God's Word effectively, you've got to study it. And you've got to share it. The Apostle Paul, this father, spiritual father to young Timothy, says in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Those things that you've heard of me, those things that you've learned, you need to share that with somebody else. Can I tell you something? We've got... Again, you try to be... I'm, I'm just... We've got some older folks in here. And you have learned and you have grown and you know things that some of us younger folks don't know. And you have a responsibility. You've learned spiritual lessons that you can pass on. You have spiritual lessons that you can instruct others in. And I'm not saying necessarily in a class. Not everybody's called to teach a Sunday school class or, 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 to, or to preach from the pulpit. Not everybody's called in that way. But I'll tell you something. There, there can be some encouragement given uh, to some young people here. There can be some direction given to some young people here. And once again, they may be children or they may be teenagers or they may be young adults. But we need, we, we need some of our older folks to pass on knowledge and wisdom to our younger people. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The things that you've learned, who are you passing that on to? You know what, if you've got kids or grandkids, read Bible stories to them. Talk to them about the Lord. For those of us, maybe our kids, and maybe even our grandkids are, are grown up now. We need to pray for them and encourage them and, and, and you know, shoot them a text with Scripture in it or, or, or give them some wisdom and guidance that comes from God's Word. But we need to show them the right example. It starts there. No one cares how much you know if they don't know how much you care, you've got to love them. You've got to live the right way. You can't live a hypocritical lifestyle. Can I tell you something? Parents today, if you've still got young kids or grandkids that, that, you're, that are in your life, can I tell you something? The way you live is more important than the things you say. And it's worth parents and grandparents us sacrificing some things to set the right example for our kids. And it may be about the way that we drive. It may be about smoking. It may be about drinking. It may be about cussing. It may be about going to church. But if there's things you want to see in your kid's life, you don't want them to smoke or drink, or, or you want to see them in church, and, and you want to see them you know, reading their Bible, then I'll tell you something. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Uh, go to church. Read your Bible. Pray. Do those things. Set the example. If you want to make a difference, you've got to be different. Don't be afraid to discipline your kids. But we need to teach and instruct our kids godly wisdom. It comes through God's Word. Reading it, studying it, living it out. Sharing it with others. We need... We need, we need more men to step up and be dads, but we need more people that will be spiritual leaders and spiritual fathers. And again, if you look in Acts 16, I, I think when Paul encountered Timothy, I, I don't think... I think Timothy was already saved, and he was already... You know, he, he had a godly mother and grandmother, and, and he was a disciple, the Bible says... But he had a lot of growing to do. There's some of us here today, we still have a lot of growing to do. And that means we need to get into God's Word and we need to look for, for, for godly examples. People that will set a high standard for us. The Apostle Paul addressed himself to the church in Corinth as a spiritual father. 
and encourage them to be followers of me. We need men and women that will set a standard. And we need young people today that are willing to follow that standard and that example. We need to do some spiritual growing. And that means to get into God's Word and to follow the example that's been given. We need some folks that will share the Gospel. They'll live it and they'll speak it. And they'll study it and let it change them. There's somebody you know that needs to draw closer to the Lord. There, there's somebody you know that needs to grow spiritually. And there may be somebody that you know that can help teach and instruct you if you're willing to listen and learn. Our worship, our walk, and our wisdom comes from God, and God will use people to pass those on to us. Will you be that person? Will you be that student? of God's Word.